UAB MedCast is an ongoing medical education podcast. The UAB Division of Continuing Education designates that each episode of this enduring material is worth a maximum of 0.25 AMA PRA Category 1 credit. To collect credit, please visit uabmedicine.org slash medcast and complete the episode's post-test. Welcome to UAB MedCast, a continuing education podcast for medical professionals. Bringing knowledge to your world. Here's Melanie Cole. The portico transcatheter aortic valve can offer outstanding control and accuracy for optimal patient outcomes. My guest today is Dr. Mark Sass. He's an associate professor in interventional cardiology at UAB Medicine. Welcome to the show, Dr. Sass. So what are the valves you're most commonly replacing these days? Yeah, the, uh, from an interventional cardiology point of view, uh, right now the only valves that have a percutaneous option are aortic valves, and that's the transcatheter aortic valve replacement. We have done a few uh, TAVR valves where we put them in mitral, uh, previously replaced mitral valves, but that's off-label and only used in dire emergencies. Uh, Unfortunately, the technology to replace the tricuspid valve and the uh, mitral valve are not ready uh, for percutaneous prime time per se. Uh, The pediatric people actually do replace the pulmonic valve in a relatively common, uh, commonly, but those are, that's uh, within the realm of congenital heart disease. But one of the new valve, one, the Sapien 3 valve, the Edwards, was just approved for replacing a uh, pulmonic valve once there is a conduit or a uh, graft that was put in mainly uh, by a surgeon. So now that valve the pulmonic position can be replaced, but currently the only valve for mainly adults that can be replaced percutaneously is the aortic valve. So typically what have been your options for replacing the aortic valve? Yeah, the, the currently the two FDA-approved devices that are on the market is uh, the Medtronic core valve and now Evolute valve and the Edwards uh, Sapien line. Uh, they've gone through... Uh, three uh, evolutions, and now we're using the currently the Sapien 3 valve to replace aortic valves. That's the one we use mainly at UAB just because we have a great experience uh, with the valve, and it seems to work for our patient population where we currently use the lowest amount of uh, contrast probably in the country and lowest amount of fluoro time because our, our between our team uh, being a multidisciplinary team and our uh, excellent uh, support from our echocardiographer and our CT uh, radiologist, we can kind of line up the valve externally before we even put it in and have an idea so we can use the least amount of uh, x-ray contrast and the use the uh, least amount of fluoro uh, because we kind of know how we're going to put it in before we even get there. So then tell us about the portico Traver valve and some of the trials that you're involved in. Yeah, the the one thing that is good, because we've done uh, the most uh, volume in uh, Alabama, we're closing in our, in our 500th TAVR. Our program was started in August of 2012, and we're probably the bu- we're definitely the busiest center in Alabama and uh, probably one of the busiest centers in the entire Southeast. And once you've created a a reputation, uh, companies are much more willing to uh, give you uh, new technologies to do in trials, and I think it offers our patient population a a much greater option. The the one that we are uh, currently trialing is the Portico uh, valve. This is a self-expanding TAVR valve uh, that uh, is currently in use in Europe, but still not FDA approved in the United States. So this will this is uh, our trial that we're going to be doing. It will be in a high risk population. That means an STS score of eight percent or greater. Eight percent means like there is a eight percent risk of dying uh, during a open uh, uh, surgical procedure. So anyone with a high risk features has the ability to be randomized to this valve versus a uh, FDA-approved device, which either would be the Medtronic uh, Evolute or the 
uh, Sapient 3 device. So it gives us another option of, uh, it, well, it, one, it gives, uh, it, we don't know how it's going to perform, but it, it for patients, I think it works nicely because I've used the device. It, it goes in quite nicely. The other thing is that the patients automatically get long, long-term follow-up. Uh, some patients are not happy with having to travel, but in most studies, patients who are followed within clinical trials actually do better because they're constantly uh, followed up by physicians and other allied health professionals to make sure that they're doing well. So uh, they never, ever get lost to follow up unless they actually just don't want to come back. And then that happens. But I think the benefit is, is that they get a uh, a valve that will replace the aortic valve, which is a deadly condition, and they get uh, they get randomized at a center that's very very experienced in doing transcatheter aortic valve replacement. And three, they get followed in the long term. And some patients, when they um, kind of go back to their normal lives after they've been fixed, they say, "Well, I feel so good." They don't want to be followed anymore, and, and all of these conditions that we uh, see, whether it's aortic valve disease, mitral disease, or even coronary disease, needs regular follow-up uh, by a cardiologist. So this valve has a unique delivery system that you mentioned, so it's for greater accuracy and, and placement, yes? Yes. The, the, the good thing about this, this is uh, fully retrievable up to uh, 80% uh, deployed. So if you don't like the position, uh, you can retrieve it, and it's quite actually the uh, quite easy to retrieve it, and then you, you retrieve it and you pull it back into the sheath, and then you reposition it, and then you redeploy it again, which is quite nice. The Currently, the balloon expandable uh, Edwards model does not have that ability, and the Medtronic uh, is not as fully retrievable as this device. Uh, the Medtronic is retrievable, but I found that it, it, it sometimes that this valve, again, I have not a lot of experience, definitely more experience with the Edwards and the uh, Medtronic version, but, but all of them are uh, excellent, excellent devices, have great data. But with this one, for your patients who may be a teeny bit sicker, who have lower ejection fractions and or have more calcium that we want to maybe place the valve a little bit differently, we have that ability with this. Again, it's a randomized trial, so they're not necessarily going to get that. But anyone who gets involved, uh, who any patient who enrolls in the trial has a 50% chance of getting this valve. So, And hopefully, if, if enough patients are enrolled, that this, pa this valve will be definitely on the market. And again, we're not trying to promote one valve over the other. The beauty of what we, the, I think the beauty of our institution is because we've done a lot, we get offered these valves, we get them offered we get the valves offered first in their current uh, form, in their most updated form. We allow, uh, we can decide and tailor which valve is better for each patient, like patients who have less calcium in their outflow tract and have kidney failure. We'll probably use the uh, Sapien 3, which is an excellent valve, excellent track record. If patients have more calcium and we have risk of annulus rupture, or uh, their ejection fraction is a little, little lower and we don't want to pace them, then we have the ability to put in uh, the uh, Medtronic uh, valve. And then hopefully if this goes well and we enroll a lot of patients, uh, then this will be a third option uh, for patients in the United States. Uh, and, and the United States is a little bit more restrictive on how these get approved. In Europe, I think they have at, at least three, and if not more, valves to choose from. Do you imagine it's going to have low rates of post-procedure pacemaker implantation complications or paravalvular leaks? I think the, the, the paravalvular leaks, I think, will be, uh, I think uh, the skirt on it is, is definitely uh, 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 good, and you, the implant depth uh, for this will be, I think, easier to kind of manage. And but all of these valves, uh, the self expanders, do have a little bit more uh, evidence of pacemaker because they're self expanding means they're made of nitinol, so they continue to expand. 
forever trying the metal tries to go back to its original form so sometimes that just continues to try to squeeze and again the heart pushes back but sometimes the conduction system is in there but i think from this point of view that it's since it's easier to retrieve and easier to deploy i think that one of the benefits is that the uh is that we may be able to avoid those pacemaker complications and avoid paravalvular leak because we can kind of check that before we fully deploy it so i think in that respect we can kind of again tailor the depth of the valve and the, and in and in most self expanders like the uh the evolute and core valve prior to that the deeper you implant the valve the higher the pacemaker risk because that's where you're impinging on the left ventricular outflow track and that's where the conduction system uh lives so with uh, the less uh, the uh, the shallower the implant depth then you actually uh have less pacemaker uh complications and then also from a paravalvular leak point of view, if you don't like where it's placed and you can see the paravalvular leak on echo, you can always, again, uh, retrieve and put it in. And again, maybe you have to put deeper so you may balance a little bit of paravalvular leak versus um, uh, pacemaker implantation. And the so there's, there's trade-offs for each of those uh, complications, but I think the the beauty of the uh, the, the retrievable uh, nature of the valve makes it uh, uh, that we can potentially uh, get the valve in in its most optimal position uh, without uh, uh, having uh, uh, spending way too long in the patient uh, trying to uh, adjust it because it is relatively easy. So unless your patients need them for another medical condition, do you imagine that you'll be using anticoagulant medications temporarily post-surgery? Well, with this, uh, with this, all the valves currently that are percutaneously placed do not require anticoagulation per se. And anticoagulation is something like warfarin, coumadin, uh, the the novel oral anticoagulants like a dabigatran, a pixaban, and, and the uh, uh, and rivaroxaban, the Xeralto and uh, Eliquis and uh, Pradaxa, those are call, those are typically called anticoagulants. There's currently tri- a new trial that will I, I don't know if we'll be participating in, but we've heard about it where they're going to try to use anticoagulants, but the current uh, practice is everyone takes aspirin indefinitely and takes either Plavix or uh, or one of its cousins, and we haven't u- we haven't studied that like Ticagrelor or Prosegrel, but usually it's aspirin and Plavix uh, for a total of six months and then aspirin indefinitely. So just like any bioprosthetic valve that the surgeons actually put in open, it's still only aspirin is the um, uh, the uh, antiplatelet of choice in the long term. We still don't know because it's still relatively new whether anticoagulants would be better, but in its current form and until we get uh, uh, guidance from the FDA and my colleagues around the country that aspirin and Plavix for six months and at then, and once the uh, Plavix is taken off at six months and then aspirin indefinitely, that's the current uh, practice. So in the last few minutes, Dr. Sass, how can a community physician refer a patient to UAB Medicine and get involved in your trials? Yeah, I mean, in the other trial that we're doing is, is Partner 3, which is the uh, uh, Sapien uh, uh, 3 valve and comparing open surgery to in low-risk patients, STS less than 4. So this is a groundbreaking trial because this will basically upset the apple cart of surgery. If, if this is shown to be beneficial compared to open surgery, uh, aortic valve uh, replacement as we know it may be uh, changed because if low-risk patients do well with this, then surgery for aortic valve disease will go down considerably, and that we're currently enrolling in partner three. So the two trials, Portico, which is high risk with a new self-expanding valve, uh, and then the uh, partner three, uh, uh, which is doing it in low-risk patients, 
we we uh, have a, a, a multidisciplinary valve clinic, and we can see that on the UAB um, Medicine uh, website. And then there is uh, anybody can be referred, uh, especially if they're in-house uh, patients. They can page the interventionalist on call through the uh, UAB page operator, and then the the line that gets everybody into UAB is 205-934-MIST-MIST, and we call it the MIST line. And that's a great way of getting patients that they have any question uh, from an outside physician or a transfer. We're happy to evaluate these patients if they're sick in the hospital, and we can usually get them whether if they if they think they're a high risk patient or a low risk patient or any patient for any of our valve uh, interventions, they can get us through uh, the whether website valve clinic, uh, the miss line, or page one of the interventionalist or surgeon on call for that day. And tell us about your team. Why is UAB so great to work with? Well, I think that the the really great thing is that uh, from a surgical point of view, uh, the uh, the person who has uh, kind of spearheaded this program is Dr. Davies, who's a one of the busiest surgeons probably in the southeast. Who, if if he wanted to do people open uh, for aortic valve disease, he could do it because he's an excellent surgeon and can get them uh, very sick patients through. Um, uh, very, very high risk surgery. But the the great thing is that he actually believes in the technology. Some surgeons out there uh, uh, are not full uh, adopters of this because it's a new technology. Everyone is always suspicious of the long term outcomes. But the we we actually published a paper here that showed that we increased the aortic valve disease volume in our hospital, meaning that we've captured more patients who would have died with this disease and have done more surgeries and subsequently also more transcatheter aortic valve replacements with a in a total lower mortality than in the past, which is the whole goal of this is to improve patient care throughout the state of Alabama and the southeast. So any, if, if you can do that and you can still increase your um, number of surgeries that are open so you're not like abandoning an old tried and true technology and increasing uh, patient uh, throughput through the institution, meaning that you're capturing more of these patients who wouldn't be treated and doing it with lower uh, complications, you can't, end, you can't get any better than that. And then we have a great cardiac anesthesia team. Our echocardiographer, again, is committed to uh, really, really improving imaging of these valves. So that helps us up front. And our CT radiologist, Dr. Satinder Singh, has just been an incredible asset to the program. And again, a great uh, advocate of uh, TAVR because our, our, our CAT scans are what I think sets us apart because we can definitely um, uh, uh, figure out what to do prior to do, getting in. Uh, to the procedure because we have such great pre-planning. And then our entire interventional team, Dr. Lisar, Dr. Saraf, and myself are all work together nicely. And, and again, it's a tr- true multidisciplinary approach with uh, a good group of cardiologists, a surgeon, an echocardiographer, CT. And the person that I can't say enough about is our coordinator, Lindsay Jernigan, and our nurse coordinator, uh, Heather Allspa, is that we have, they're incredibly committed to the program and really want to help the, the patients of this area. Thank you so much, Dr. Sass, for being with us today. You're listening to UAB MedCast. For more information on resources available at UAB Medicine, you can go to uabmedicine.org slash physician. That's uabmedicine.org slash physician. This is Melanie Cole. Thanks so much for listening.